Something I've just learned is that I can actually detach these windows if I drag them into the file area. So that's kind of nice because now I can switch between windows and I keep, I can have one very large and not everything is so large and that will make it easier to look at plots and things. I've also um, made a few small updates. So if you if you want to just use the uh, version control icon and pull branches, you will have the latest version of the EDA introduction. <coughs> what did we learn about um, quantile plots? What, what interesting things did you find? So I had a number of discussions um, about what do these quantile plots actually mean? How, how can we understand what, what we're doing here? If this was a, a quick postprandial quiz, could you write down meaning of a quantile plot and get away with it? So essentially what we're doing with these quantile plots <coughs> is we're comparing the shape of a distribution. So it's relatively easy if we analyze quantitatively to compare means and variances and standard deviations and, 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 and ranges and everything, but there's more subtle information encoded in the shape of the histogram, in the shape of the distribution. And that's what we do with the quantile plot. Essentially we, we build a histogram. Um, along the quantiles, and then we compare how these histograms match up against each other. So we get rid of any variances that are simply due to shifts, we get rid of variances that are simply due to, to scaling, um, and we basically look at the shape. And if the shapes are very similar, then the quantile plots will fall on a straight line. If the shapes are different, then the quantile <laughs> plots will, will differ. And I think what many of you who've compared controls against LPS-stimulated data have seen is that there's a break in the data. So the parts on the left-hand side are kind of linear, and then around the value of, of minus 10, usually it shifts, it, it drops down, or there's a curve there, or, or, or stuff is different. The way I would interpret this is that <clears throat> in the in the with the values of the small enrichments that we're seeing, um, the, the controls and the stimulated distributions are essentially the same. So there are localized differences, but essentially uh, the, the differences in the individual genes um, correspond to noise. So there's no big difference there. But there are significant differences in the higher enrichment sections. And that's where things actually happen. So whenever you have distributions or, or, or plots or lines or regressions that seem to have two lines, you always have to think about probably there are more, there's more than one population in my sample here. And in this case, the two populations that would come to mind are the regulated and the non-regulated genes. The ones that correspond to an in, that uh, respond to an induction with LPS, and the ones that do not respond to such an induction. Now, if we know that, and we can say, well, oh, all overall, there seems to be a breakpoint between the regulated ones and the non-regulated ones around the value of minus 10. We can use this information for subsetting the data, and we could then just pull out all the values where there's where where genes at some point uh, fall below minus 10. Um, or not, and um, thus increase the contrast between signal and noise in our data set analysis. 
There's nothing we knew about that before we looked at the data. So this is a completely unbiased um, exploration of the data, looking at some of the distributional properties, i.e. Sh essentially the shape of the histogram, and then from that figuring out that probably there are two subsets of data there and how we can pull them apart and uh, use that for further analysis. So this is why QQ plots are, are interesting. It'll probably take a little while to uh, wrap your mind around what that means. Um, again, the, the best thing to do is Remember that we're basically looking at the shapes of distributions here. Think of how you could use something like that in your own data at home. For example, by then comparing distributions from your own data against normal distributions with QQ norm or with uh, between controls and, and, and experiments. And um, ultimately, it'll click and it'll work and you'll be um, as confused as now but on a higher level, as we say. <clears throat> now, I'd like to shift gears, still stay with, with um, exploration of data, and look at um, a few scatter plots with flow cytometry data. So not to go too deep into scatter plots, there are loads of examples in the plotting reference, but I'd like to just, you know, create some visuals before we move on to completely other thing. There's a a table, gvhd.txt, in, in the package. It's a rather large table. And um, this is tab separated values, including a header row. And I got this many years ago from uh, Saurabh Shah, I believe. Um, this is graft versus host disease. So uh, flow cytometry of uh, graft versus host disease. And this time we read this with read table, graft versus host disease dot text, header equals true because there is a header line. And that's what this looks like. Um, <coughs> So I'm not entirely sure what, what, the, what these channels are. Uh, this column here is um, FITC labeled uh, CD4 surface antigen. This column here is um, CD8 uh, labeled um, uh, probably phycoerythrin. Yes. This would be CD3 labeled um, per CP. Another different wavelength fluorophore, and uh, this is probably allophycocyanine. I don't know the full name, but yeah. these are essentially just fluorescent dyes. Exactly. So different uh, fluorescent dyes. Um, how do they how do they color the cells? How do we get the s the dyes specifically onto the cells? So the cells have different fluorescent colors. Antibodies. Antibodies. So we chemically conjugate the dye to an antibody which specifically recognizes CD8 or CD3 or CD4. Note that we have two columns for CD8 here. What can we do with that? Exactly. We should expect that these two channels cor correlate very well with each other, um, i.e. if one value is high, in one channel, it should also be high in the other channel. That's, an, that's a good internal control of a dye effect during that labeling. OK, so let's play with that data. Um, <coughs> for example, um, we could extract um, only the CD3 positive cells if we look at a histogram, what would we consider to be CD3 positive? You know, there's a, there's a distribution of labeling events. Um, for the purposes of the tutorial, we've always used the number of 280. That's about here, breaking it around the middle. And then basically subset our data and say, GV graph versus host disease, CD3 positive is a data frame of our original data where 
column 5 of our original data is greater than 280, so a subset, and of that we want the columns 3 to 6. So now we have the four die labeled channels here in columns one, two, three, and four, <coughs> and only some of the rows are used. Uh, how many how many rows do we still have? How many how many elements in this? How do you, how can we tell? How many cells are still in this data set? Can we do DIM? I don't know. Let's try. What does this mean? DIM. It's the dimensions of our object. So this is a two-dimensional object, and it has um, 2,089 in one dimension and four in the other dimension. We've already seen that we have four columns, so that would be the columns in 2,089. Any other way? Can you not click on the Can we not click somewhere? Let's click somewhere. Uh, where we have the list, is it a file that gives data? D data here. Yeah. If we click on there and we'll look at it and it's, it tells us 2089. Is there another way? Can we do structure? We can do structure. data frame of that. Can we have another way? Why am I harping on this? This is because if I do DIM, that's, I, I think this is completely correct. Um, looking it up and using structure basically has that information as a side effect. If I want to write it into code, I would like to make more explicit what I'm actually doing. And thus I would use um, the command n row. <clears throat> to tell me that. Why do I need that? Well, sometimes I need to iterate over it row by row by row, and then I often put um, for i in one colon n row of whatever the object is. I think that's the most explicit way to document what that number is, what it does, and, and where it comes from. There's a cognate n call that does the same thing for columns. Okay, so uh, let's plot it. So here we plot um, all the rows and two columns. So what's the x and what's the y in this? So if you think about this as, a, as two columns of the entire thing, then the first column is implicitly used as an x value, and the second column is implicitly used as a y value. And that's our scatter plot of um, Croft versus host disease, CD4 and versus CD8. Um, incidentally, we just um, mentioned that CD8 against CD8 would be a good internal control and it should be highly correlated. So that would be column um, 2 against column 4. Let's have a quick look. different. This is columns 2, 3, and 4. Okay, well, uh, since we have it now, um, <coughs> if we give the plot function more than one column of a data frame, uh, more than two columns of a data frame, it shows us all of the combination plots. So I mistyped here, instead of 2 and 4, i.e. C 
two comma four, um, I type two colon four, which expands to two three four. So now I'm seeing um, a scatter plot of column two against column three, two against four, three against two, three against three, three against four, and so on. So the one that I was looking at is two and four. It, this would be this one, or that one. This is two against four, and this is four against two. Same difference. And what do we notice? Are they well correlated? Not really, right? And it's kind of weird. It's not just noise. So apparently some subsets of these cells can be easily labeled um, by both fluorophores, and some sub subsets of these cells don't, especially in the middle intensities. There's something weird going on as the, as the signal of um, CD8 APC increases. Uh, the signal for CD8 BPE doesn't seem to increase as much. <clears throat> so the truth of the number of receptors is somewhere between these extremes of plots, and that's what you have to keep in mind when you look at data like that. Um, so how would you change the code just to plot um, column 2 and 4? This way. That's what I meant. Interesting. Um, so there's a lot of overlap in these plots. And I would just like to demonstrate a few ways to, to work with data that is very dense and to find basically what the underlying um, what the underlying distributions of elements are, like here. There's a lot there's, there's so much overlap that we can't really um, appreciate the fine structure. Now, <clears throat> One way to, to look at this is hexpin. So hexpin is, is kind of like um, a two-dimensional analog to histograms. So instead of having histograms all on one line, it puts histograms into the plane, and each single histogram has a hexagonal, state, uh, hexagonal uh, shape so that the plane is completely tiled and um, the, the elements of, uh, that fall into each bin are approximately uh, equally distant from each other. And there's a function here, hex bin, um, which we can feed our graft versus host disease. Uh, we can specify how many bins we want, and we can specify the colors that um, <coughs> that are uh, being used. So the hex bin actually um, basically specifies an, a data object, and the plot function then knows what to do with that data object based on the class that is assigned to it. Here you go. So this is a hex bin plot. Uh, useful for very dense data. So now looking at this, I think we can appreciate very clearly that there seem to be um, at least four different populations of cells in our graft versus host disease that we probably need to consider differently. It's the same way of uh, like we um, looked at our QQ plot and determined that probably there's more than one population in, in, in the in the genes and we should analyze them separately thus, that would be basically the same 
with these that that's demonstrated with the hex bins. Yep. So in the code you specified just four different colors, but yet on the graph we have a range of colors. Right. Uh, okay. So there's a lot of information on colors in the plot reference, but essentially what happens is that the function color ramp palette returns as its value a function. And that function generates the colors. So let me let me show you what I'm talking about here. So this is a <coughs> this is a very bright yellow color, much red, much green, lots of blue. And this is a kind of a dark blue color. And there, these are some intermediate colors. So basically, this specifies fixed points in a possible gradient of colors. And the function color ramp palette creates <coughs> a function that, is assigned, that can be assigned to the variable. So if I have. Um, if I assign the output of color ramp palette to the variable f call, um, then I can use f call to create color values that will lie on that ramp. So if I need five color values, it will give me five color values, starting from um, the first one I specified, going to the last one I specified, and having something in between. So notice I only specified four, but I can get five colors here. If I need more than five color values, i.e. in this case I need 20 color values, if call will give me 20 color values. Again, starting from the beginning, ending at the end, and going smoothly in between. So this is what, how we can end up with uh, as many color values as we want, smoothly varying. Now, if I would, if I would have changed this to something more purple, I would get a different color ramp. So I can, I, can, I can either get very smooth or, or very, um, very different. The, the use of color in, in plotting uh, needs some care and thought. So what we can do is we can color either in, um, in, a, in a quantitative sense, i.e. one extreme of values is, say, light, and one ex the other extreme of values is dark. Often we use things like heat colors, so uh, black for low values and uh, going via uh, red and yellow all the way up to white for very high values to emulate um, the, the emission spectrum of, of, of iron or something. But we can also use colors for categorical differences. So if we have apples and oranges, we would color them you know, green and orange, for example. Um, because that is a good mnemonic for us to identify categories of elements in our data plots. So these are, these are different ways of, of using color. So it, 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 it shouldn't be arbitrary. But there's a, there's a fair bit of information and, and some examples in that in, in the plot reference script. OK, so hex bin is one version of doing this. The other version of, of uh, plotting to, and dealing with overlap is something called smooth scatter. This basically smooths uh, the points um, and, and gives us this, this kind of a cloudy, low-resolution appearance, um, kind of reflecting the fact that there's error associated with every single of these data values 
and then giving us dark colors where there's a lot of overlap. Somewhat similar is if we vary the colors themselves by density. So if, <clears throat> if a data point falls into a very dense region, we would give it a darker color. And if it falls into a very non-dense region, it, if, if the next neighbors are all far away in the scatter plot, we could give it a lighter color. And this is by using the dense calls function on these two, um, on, on the two data columns as the color argument in a plot. PCH is the plotting character that we use. CX is the character expansion. So the plotting characters we use can be uh, circles and squares and triangles and daggers and stars and, and, and different things. And these are identified by individual numbers. Again, refer to the plotting reference. Now, PCH16 is, is, is a way to plot things <coughs> so we can specify um, the elements to be filled with a, uh, with a particular color. And CEX, the character expansion, expansion uh, specifies whether the plotted um, symbol is going to be large or small. So if we plot this here, it kind of looks like the scatter plot, but, but, but more defined. Um, if we make CX smaller, we get smaller dots. And um, yeah, so you can, you can also appreciate the internal structure of data sets that, that overlap. And this trellis plot, which is, which is implicit, um, on, on this kind of lattice, uh, we've accidentally stumbled in before. So that's what I basically wanted to cover as, as a first introduction um, to looking into data. We've talked about plotting data in, in various ways, um, defining some um, statistical measures, some statistics like mean values and variances um, in order to characterize our data, how to use quantile analysis to um, analyze the distributions of our data points and compare them. Um, but to get a little more quantitative than that, um, one of the most frequent types of analysis we do are is uh, regression analysis. So let's spend time some time on regression analysis. So we'll talk a bit uh, about correlations. We've mentioned the word correlation before. Um, but let's have a closer look at what correlations mean. We'll talk a little bit about linear and nonlinear regression. Um, unless there's huge demand, I'm actually not going to explicitly go over nonlinear correlation. Um, but the principles should be clear from uh, linear correlations. And there's code for how to specify functions and how to um, uh, take functions through uh, nonlinear least square fit. We'll talk about that later. And of course, um, we should be able to compute or not compute them. So here's the scenario. These are points on a scatter plot. And uh, that's a very noisy scatter plot. But nevertheless, even though it's a noisy scatter plot, we kind of see that there's a trend that if values are small on the x axis, they're kind of also small on the y axis. And um, conversely, if they're large on the x-axis, they're also kind of uh, large on the y-axis. So some of the information that we store in the x and y is actually redundant, because some of the information of x can be recomputed and then give a value of y, or can be used to predict values of y. 
So this is what we mean when we, when we say data is correlated, i.e., um, <clears throat> a part of the data depends on another dimension of the data. Now, if we assume that, um, just for example, the x values could be um, the height of people that we've measured in meters. So we have small ones and tall ones. And um, the y value could be their um, weight in, in kilos. So we have small ones that are rather light and tall ones that are more stout or in the middle here. And the question is, how do we, how do we quantify it? how to what degree these are correlated if we quantify that what does that even mean and how do we get the parameters uh, that can define this correspondence and that's where we get into correlations so correlations don't imply causality that's that's another question um, in in R, the function core correlation measures a correlation coefficient, and the values can go from minus 1 to 1, and, z and 0 has, uh, means no correlation. So these correlations are parts of models. And linear regression is, is one of the possible statistical models that we can apply to data analysis. Now, for a statistician, a model is not what you perhaps might think it is. So a model does not mean we have um, a kind of a quantitative understanding of nature and we can plug in some values into that quantitative understanding and we'll spit out the correct results. A statistician's model is simply a statistical function that um, creates data that has properties which come as close as possible to the properties of the observed data. So it's a black box, but it is supposed to have the same properties statistically as the observed data. So what we do here in, in modeling is we specify a model. In, in this case here, it would be um, that there's a linear model that we can apply. We estimate the parameters of that model. So for a linear model, the parameters would be the slope and the intercept of the y-axis. And then we ask, well, is the model any good? Does it actually explain our data well? Um, if it is not good, we either re-estimate the parameters or we specify a different model. But if it's adequate, we can use the model, for example, for prediction. Now, linear regression assumes a particular model. Um, and the model is that there is some offset plus some um, proportional uh, factor here, basically a multiplicative factor plus some errors. And <clears throat> these different components of the model go by different names that you will encounter in the literature, things like independent valuable or predictor valuable, regressor, exposure variable, and maybe input variable. And the result is the dependent variable. So there are two parameters that you can independently fit one is the regression coefficient, i.e. something that characterizes the slope, and one is the intercept. So the implicit assumptions here is that our whole system only has two variables that are of interest. Of course, there's also errors or noise, but we would like to try to exclude that. One variable is the response, and one is a predictor. Um, we don't need to adjust for confounding or other between subject variation, i.e. confounding means if we have two variables that change in the same direction um, due to a similar effect. So one example of confounding is it's well known. Uh, actually, I don't even know. Do, do we have storks in North America? Do we? I've, I've never actually realized that. Canada? Yeah. Anyway, so in, 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 in Germany, um, there are used to be lots of storks and as you know that Germany is, is, is also one of the first world country with uh, declining 
um, fer fertility rates. So fertility rates are declining. And it also appears that the number of storks are um, <laughs> declining. So there's a very clear correlation there between the number of storks and the number of babies that are um, appearing in the households. Um, does this mean that we're validating the idea that babies are brought by storks? Um, not necessarily. So is it just sp spurious? It's not necessarily spurious either. The underlying realization is that both of these effects are caused by industrialization or affluence. As people become richer and uh, are perhaps better embedded in a social network and have old age security, it becomes less important to have many, 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 many children to feed you porridge once your teeth fall out. Um, and at the same time, industrialization also reduces the wet meadows, which produce lots of frogs, um, which are good food for the storks, and thus um, the habitat of the stork is reduced. So this industrialization is a confounding factor, which acts both on the number of storks as well as on the fertility rates in society. And um, both of these effects are influenced in the same direction. So if we analyze them one against the other, we will find a correlation. But there's no causality implied. However, there's a relationship which is determined through that so-called confounding factor. We could adjust for that confounding factor by simply measuring how much of um, an effect the confounding factor has, and then re re specifically removing that confounding factor effect from our original data sets, and then asking whether they're still correlated, and usually we will find that they're then no longer correlated. So this is an adjustment that we would need for confounding factors, um, which we can do with basically uh, regression analysis that we would do beforehand. So it's part of um, of um, cleaning up your data before you analyze it. But that's the assumption. Any kind of cleaning up of the data that needs to be done is already done before we throw our data into the linear de uh, regression analysis. Um, another assumption is that, well, it's actually linear. It's not quadratic, it's not sinus sinusoidal or anything else, not exponential, but linear. If it's not linear, it, it can be fit, anything can be fit but the fit will not be meaningful. Um, the correlation coefficient, the variance should be constant and especially it should be independent of the size of the value, so we shouldn't have larger variance if the, if the values are large. The errors should be independent of each, each other and for proper statistical inference, the errors um, or the noise should actually be normally distributed. So even a simple statistical regression like linear regression has a number of implicit assumptions that we make. Fortunately, most of these assumptions are not bad, so we can live with them. Now, once we do linear regression, we estimate the parameters, and then we need to ask ourselves, well, how good is the model in the first place? Can we believe our parameters? How much of our data is, would then be covered by a prediction? And one of the reasons why linear regression is so important is because it has an analytic solution. What does that mean, an analytic solution? And what's the opposite? Ever heard that term? It comes up a lot in com computation. Well-behaved problems may have analytic solutions. Messy problems have numeric solutions, if they have solutions at all. So analytic solutions are solutions that can be solved in closed form with an algebraic formula. Numeric solutions don't have closed form solutions, so we need to start trying things or simulating things, somehow running an optimization algorithm that will find the solution by slowly, slowly, slowly iterating itself towards a correct solution. That's numeric. These things are often slow. They often get stuck in local minima. Um, there's a number of other issues. And nonlinear least squares fit, i.e. fitting fundamentally different models um, like logistic regressions or 
or um, trigonometric functions um, have these properties. Linear regression, uh, linear regression, on the other hand, is well behaved. There's an analytical solution which we can compute. This means it's fast, it's efficient. We can apply it to very large data sets, and it's a good assumption for a first kind of look. Uh, yeah, so let's study this in code. Mohammed. Yeah. Um, so is that something that we measure or is this something that we estimate? There are new statistical methods that actually try to work with quantitative estimations of error terms and get some interesting results. For our practical purposes, what we do is we estimate the slope and the intercept and then treat these as the residuals, i.e. the differences from the predicted value and the actually observed value. But that these are residuals and not true effects in the data is, is again an assumption that perhaps can be improved upon. Okay, so um, this is a different R project. Um, the project is REDA regression. Um, you download it in the usual way. Let me show you the link. with the um, URL of the repository, github.com, Hugin REDA regression. R underscore EDA capitals hyphen regression. And once that is loaded, type in it. <coughs> so we'll have some stuff. Anybody stuck at that point? Wave your hands, put up a red post-it. No, everybody got it? Wonderful. So in any kind of modeling analysis, um, it's really important to, to be able to generate synthetic data. You're going to try to estimate parameters of an unknown distribution according to some model. And how would you know that your estimation is correct? How would you know that the functions that you're using and the procedures that you're <coughs> using actually have the capability to find the right parameters? Well, what you do is you, write, you, you generate some synthetic data for which you already know the parameters. And then you try to recover the known parameters. And if you can get something that's close to the known parameters, you may have some confidence um, that your workflow is valid. If you omit to do that, it's just a wild guess. It may be right for the wrong reason. It may be entirely wrong. Um, and if you publish results based on that, you're in a good way to have a conversation uh, with the dean about um, your recent retraction. Uncomfortable. What, the model? If one is to use uh, linear regression for uh, studies, would it require validation using a synthetic data set? 
Would it require that? Unfortunately not, which is pretty terrible. But um, what people do more and more frequently is they take all of their code uh, that they've used in the analysis of the data, they post it on GitHub, and then everybody can start uh, reproducing the data if they're, if they're interested. That's the modern way to work in reproducing this. Put it out there. And make your rep reviewers feel confident that you know they can trust your data because you you applied the utmost care and, and generate. Now here's a small function that generates synthetic um, height and weight samples according to a function that I've essentially I've just made up. Um, it takes the parameter n, the number of variables or, or, or random numbers that we would like to retrieve, just like our norm has that parameter n that tells us how many numbers it should generate. Um, it has a parameter hi, height minimum of 1.5 meters, just to constrain it, um, a number ha, height maximum of 2.3 meters. Um, I think that's kind of reasonable. Um, it has a scaling factor of 40. That kind of seemed to give sensible numbers to me. Um, we set a seed value here to have things reproducible. If I would be doing this in for a, for a function that I would uh, reuse more often, I would allow the option to turn off the seed or to pass the seed as a parameter into the function, not to always get the same um, values. Then I make a matrix, something like a two-dimensional vector, with n rows and two columns. And then I generate a column of heights in the interval defined by hi and ha. And that uses the function runiform. So this is not run if, this is R uniform. Oh, okay, so that's not, that's not defined. So um, say if, um, let's say, seven values between 20 and 23. So this gives me values. And where the values for the normal distribution were, of course, accord, uh, distributed according to that bell curve, the values of the uniform distribution are just uniform within a specified interval. So basically, this is random numbers in the interval. And then I generate a column of weights with a linear model. And the linear model is simply Q, i.e. this number 40, times what we find in the column of weights, uh, of, of, of heights, and adding 1. And after we've computed that, we also add noise to the data. Otherwise, we would have a perfect linear correlation, but adding, adding noise to that gives us um, some variability. And then we can create an object simply by saying this function, um, return me 50 values with the default parameters. And uh, we can plot that in the same way we used scatter plots before. If you have a very good visual memory, you will notice that this is strikingly similar to the plot that I have shown in the PowerPoint slides um, for reasons that are probably self-explanatory. OK. Now, um, what about the coefficient of correlation? That's easy to calculate. It's just a function COR. Um, with the first column and the second column. So that calculates the correlation between height and weight. 
Bingo, here we are, 0.54. Yes. What does that mean? Good, bad, high, low, what should we expect? Not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know. This is a number. We often have these, these procedures that give us numbers. So we need some frame of reference to interpret this, this number in. What, what, what's a high correlation? What's a very high correlation? How, how, does, that, how does that look like? So let's try to, to build some, some mental images. Let's ask, um, what kind of correlation coefficient do we even get if we take a perfect correlation or a less than perfect correlation? And for this, <coughs> um, I take 50 random values according to the normal distribution. Um, and I set a little constant here, and then I define the y values that correspond to the x values as the product of this constant plus 1 minus r times another set of random values. So what this means essentially is that in this case, I have 99% um, of my data is, has a perfect linear correlation, and 1% of my data is random noise. In this case, 80% of my data has a perfect correlation, and 20% is random noise. And in this case, 0.1% of my data is, is, um, is correlated, and 99% of my data is random noise. And we can plot that and then see what the correlation coefficients are. So this is the first case here. Noise is only 1%. Uh, Correlation coefficient is 0.9999577, so very close to 1. If we have a correlation coefficient like that, that's kind of what the data looks like. Very, very much everything falling on a single line. Here it gets scattered out a little more. This is a correlation coefficient of 0.97 you already have significant scattering, i.e. 20% randomness, but um, still um, R value of 0.97. 60%. In this case, the R value drops down to 0.57. So this is um, the kind of a, of a data cloud um, this is not our height and weight, even though it kind of looks similar, but that's approximately what that looks like. Um, yeah, remember, our correlation was 0.54. That correlation is 0.57. So um, they, they kind of look, look similar. Both 0.50, so, so things, correlation coefficients of 0.5 or even 0.4 are still considered quite significant. Matters become a lot less trustworthy if the correlation gets less. And in the case of just 1%, um, so this is, this is essentially a random correlation. And the coefficient here is minus 0.04, so very close to 0. So that's the kind of intuition we can form about the actual value of the correlation coefficient and what kind of, what degree of scatter or what degree of noise that represents. So up to around 0.5, it's pretty good. Now, remember we said that um, <coughs> the relation is not necessarily linear in, uh, in, in um, biological data. We often have sigmoidal functions, or we have exponential functions, or um, distributions that are normal in one degree, but since the values can never be negative, they're censored, and then, then uh, there's, there's a skewness in the tail. So what happens if that's not linear? So let's have a look at some correlation coefficients of functions that are not linear. And I'm doing this with, with data that is um, 
from a uniform distribution between minus 1 and 1. And this mixing factor here that I've used above of 80% uh, or 40%, I'm setting that to 0.9. So the actual correlation now is 90% uh, functional and 10% noise. Now in the linear case, it looks like that. So that's the linear case at that level, and our correlation coefficient is 0.98. So what happens if it's a periodic thing, i.e., um, we're looking at correlations of time series in cell cycles? So this is going through one cell cycle, periodic. Again, 90% functional, 10% noise. Now the correlation coefficient is virtually zero. The coefficient of correlation tells us that this data is not correlated. The scatter plot tells us that's actually not true. It's not linearly correlated. But finding the right function would allow us to make a very good prediction of what the data are. What about polynomial? So here I'm using an uh, x squared function, parabola. Same problem. Very nice correlation with a parabola, very, very poor coefficient of correlation. Exponential. The values get very high, so the, the noise kind of gets suppressed. Here we actually get a reasonable coefficient of correlation. Why? Well, if we draw a regression line here, we could, we could kind of fit it in here, and then there would be outlier values that wouldn't contribute as, as strongly, and so we could, only looking at the number, kind of believe that there's something there. But of course, the fit, having this exponential data and then fitting it with a linear function is, is, is wrong. Circular. Data on a circle here. Again, virtually a relationship of zero. So that's the caveat here. The correlation coefficient picks out things that are linear correlations quite well. But if your underlying model is not a linear correlation, then of course the correlation coefficient may be entirely meaningless. So we have to be careful. This is why EDA um, is so important. Just using canned procedures and, and, and calculating numbers may be very, very misleading. It's, it's really important to look at your data, look at the scatter plots, and try to determine whether your um, statistical model is actually correct. That said, um, calculating a linear regression in, in R is absolutely trivial. All we need is the tilde operator. Um, so note that this is a tilde. This is the character that is at the left top of your keyboard. This is not a hyphen, so look carefully. Linear model of height weight column 2 against height weight column 1. And um, that gives us the parameters. Intercept minus 2.8 and um, a slope of 42. Is that any good? So remember, we work with synthetic data. What did we put into the data? Your slope is 40. Your slope should be 40. 40. That was the slope. And the intercept? plus one. So is it good? I think it's pretty good. You know, looking at that, that degree of, of um, <coughs> of scatter that, that we do have here, um, getting the um, parameters right to 
um, yeah, very high reliable, re very high reliability is is actually quite surprising. Um, so, right. So we replot that. Now let's plot a regression line. So we use this ab line again. Only this case we don't uh, specify vertical or horizontal, but we feed it a regression <coughs> model. And AppLine then is able to take the parameters from the regression model and plot the, the correct regression line. Here it is. This is the regression line. Uh, what's this line? What does it represent? Intuitively, <coughs> we, we say, OK, um, you know, it kind of characterizes where the data would be um, in the abstract case, in the ideal case, but mathematically, what? Why do we put the line into this into this spot? Is the line that has um, the distance of each point from the line is the smallest? The sum of the distances for each point to the line is the smallest. Right. It's a square of the sum. Almost. Square of the sum. Yeah. Not the square of the sum. The sum of the squares. Right? So this line minimizes the number that you get when you take the distance of each line, of each point from the line, and square that and add all of these together. So this is why it's called a least squares fit. So it's a fit that generates a mathematical formula where that distance is, is minimized. Um, <clears throat> now, residuals are these difference values. And we can easily calculate the residuals to look at our plots. We can also easily calculate the idealized values with the function fitted. So fitted, again, takes this uh, the linear formula and knows how to extract the values from the linear formula and put that into a vector. So we can then use what we calculated for residuals and for fits to plot the differences. And we do that by um, plotting um, these as segments. So these are now unconnected line segments. That's another way to put additional information onto a plot. A segment needs four points, x1, y1, x2, y2. So x1 are the values we find on the x-axis of height, the first column in our data. x2, or y, is the second line. So taking these together, is, it says our segment starts at one of the data points. That's the coordinates of one of the data points. We find that in these two values. And our segment goes to the same point on the x-axis, but a point on the <coughs> y-axis that we find in fit, i.e. in the idealized value. So taken together, this will draw a line from the data value um, down to the corresponding point on the regression line. So this is a plot that shows us the residuals. And the square of the length of these red line is what's being minimized. <coughs> OK, then we can plot fit against residuals. This is this. What's that good for? So this is the fitted value. This is the residual value. If we look at 
the correlation, we see that fit against residual is extremely close to zero. Well, that's not surprising because the, the model was built in such a way that um, that should be minimized and should be as close to zero as numerically possible. And that's successful. So ideally, the correlation between fit and residual should be zero. What would it mean if there is remaining correlation in fit and residual? Yeah, we have confounding effects, all my errors. Mm, no, it would mean that we can come up with a linear model that is better than the one we have. But by the definition, the one we have is already the best one. Right, so we could then adjust our linear model to further reduce fit against residual, um, which, which is kind of contradictory to the, to the mathematics behind this, which is already optimal. But there's another way in which um, fit against residual could come out systematically different, and that's if the linear model is no good. If the linear model is not able to remove um, any kind of a systematic effect in the, in, the, in the residuals, it means we really have to, we have to change our linear model. So, um, <clears throat> right. Um, so that's one way to see whether the linear model is adequate. We plot fit against residual, and only if the linear model is adequate will we see that this is now a, a random and uncorrelated data set. Um, then the linear model is good. Isn't that the same? Um, not necessarily. There is the Isn't fit plus residual the observed value? It is. So the observed value is residual minus fit? So it should come out the same. We can try that in the coffee break, and, and but I, th I think you know, there's no different information there. Because fit plus residual gives the observed value. There's no, no independent observation. <clears throat> okay. Now, in order to further characterize whether um, this is any good and what we can do with the parameters, there are two aspects of our linear model that we need to discuss. And one is uh, prediction limits, and another one is confidence limits. Prediction limits tell us boundaries on future observations. And so they say how well the model is expected to accommodate new data. If we plot prediction boundaries on our plot, we can, we can, we can tell where in our plot new data points that are not in our observed population could possibly fall. Whereas confidence limits uh, give us boundaries on the adequate model, so they, they kind of characterize how well the model is expected to, um, how well the model is expected to Oh, I don't have that. Um, to to accommodate the data. So if we go back here, yeah, use this one. Um, the confidence limits would tell us the possible range of slopes and intercepts that we can have on that red line, whereas the prediction intervals would tell us the possible range of where points could fall. Now, when R, um, 
both are calculated with predict. One is calculated with predict um, interval equals p, and one is calculated with interval equals pc. And it gives us the fitted values that we've seen before, and a lower and an upper bound. So for the first observation, which is in our data set, um, we have the fitted value, the one that would, you know, I don't, I don't know which one the first value is. Let's assume it's this one. Um, oh, actually, I can tell it's 60.57. So um, actually, it's probably this one here, or this one. Um, it should, there's a lower and an upper bound um, for the model at that spot. The lower bound is that the fitted point could lie around 51, i.e. down here, and the upper bound is it could lie around uh, 69, i.e. here. So this, these are possible bounds on, on, the, on the fitted intervals. So basically this then tells us where, where this could lie. Now, um, all we need to do to, to plot these boundaries is to take the numbers we find in lower and in upper and plot them on our, our plot here. But that's um, not as easy as just saying lines of these columns here, because um, the values are not ordered. So if we simply do a command and, and do lines from point to point to point, the lines would jump all over and that's not what we're looking for. The lines should go from the smallest to the largest. And in order to plot them from the smallest to the largest, we have to use order again, as we've done before, i.e. we need to sort our data frame in ascending or descending. So <clears throat> we should recompute PP and PC in sorted order, and then we can plot them. First, we plot um, the data. It's now plotted in an ordered way, which we can't tell. It's the same data. But now we, we start with this, then that, then that, then that, and so on. And we can use the function matlines um, to plot the upper and lower bounds. So these are the upper and lower bounds of the fit, i.e., within um, the confidence interval, which I think by default is, is um, 0 0.05 of probability, i.e., something that is still significant, a line that somehow lies in this field here would explain the data equally well as this line here. So we can say our model lies somewhere in this bound here. The mean of where it could lie is this gray line, but it means that there's a lot of noise and other um, lines could explain the data equally well. Um, and in terms of the prediction intervals, we have this here, and this says, again, within our confidence limits, a new data point would fall in between these two lines. We would be surprised if it lies outside. Um, that would kind of um, violate our assumptions about how well the model performs in this case. However, if we have large numbers of data points, we are almost certain to find some that lie outside some of the time. So what's the warning message you're getting about future responses? <sighs> warning. In predict, predictions on current data refer to future responses. So these are not predictions about the current data. So it's a prediction about something that's not observed in the data. Why is that there as a warning? Honestly, I don't know. 
Maybe it's just a reminder about how statistics works in principle, but it's kind of odd. I should look it up. Okay, now this is what I would consider a complete regression plot, i.e. you show the data. We can actually f see what the data looks like. Here it's not a whole lot of data, but if it's more than, than that, if it's very much data, um, we've looked at scatter plots with density colors or with hex spin or whatever, all of which you can use to create a plot about lots of data and, and the density of the data. That, that's still informative. You show the regression line. That's the result of where we believe, what our best belief is, what the correct model here is. You show the confidence intervals for the model. Um, which will be broad or narrow depending on how well our data actually is explained by the model. And you show the prediction limits, i.e., if we have new data, where would we expect this to lie in? So with this plot, we're not just showing our analysis of the data, but we, we, we're documenting the quality of the analysis. The difference between this and simply showing a regression line is the same difference um, if we have a bar plot without the whiskers on top that show uh, the significance of the lines. So basically think of this as a two-dimensional or a, um, a regression analysis equivalent of such a bar plot. Right, so we have about um, 10 minutes before we break for coffee break. Um, how about, yeah, how about you take our, our um, data and produce one regression line plot for um, what would be a good regression plot? Yeah, let's just take any of the cell lines um, take the controls, compare them to the LP LPS stimulus, and produce a scatter plot from that, and produce um, a plot of this type on top of that. So basically, all you need to do is to copy some of this code, throw out the comments because you don't need them. Um, and, and um, add, uh, uh, change, the, uh, change the, the labels of the, of the R objects that we're using here and the column numbers. If you're really lazy or smart, which is in computing the same thing, um, <laughs> you would overwrite HW column one with a control and overwrite HW two, um, uh, HW one with a control, HW two with an LPS plot, then you don't even need to change the code. Right? You don't understand what I just proposed? Um, or you could easily reproduce it. That's the wonderful thing about the script. But yes, indeed, I'm, I'm implying that.
And once again, if it doesn't work, if you're stuck, if I've been confusing you all afternoon and you don't know what to do, then show us a red post-it.
Mm-hmm. Ask. Sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, no. I might ask. have missed this, uh, but what is the significance of ordering uh, our vector before entering it into the <coughs> prediction? Okay. Um, remember, we, we, we went to, to make a map plot of these boundary lines. Now, if they're unordered, our data values might have plotted like this. And then if we, if we use the sigma plot, it will start with the first, go to the second, go to the third. <laughs> oh, That's not what we want. If we order them, it will go right. Sorry, that was an obvious question. Sorry. No, it wasn't obvious. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll save it. Now, just very briefly, um, my solution for this very simply would be, since we have a new project, we need to reload the data. Um, so we load the data um, from that path. The two dots mean go one level up to the parent directory. We specify the directory in which we want to descend down, which is the REDA introduction. And from that, we pull the, our data for the LPS dat. Then we make a matrix with the number of rows equal to the number of rows in LPS dat and the number of columns equals two. And we place the two columns that we're interested in. In this case, I'm using macrophage control against macrophage lipopolysaccharide. And we place that into column one and column two of HW. I'm using HW, as I said before, because I'm lazy. I don't, 
um, I can then just use the code that I've used previously to do everything. Now plotting the uh, prediction and confidence limits first requires us to order it, i.e. creating this ordering vector, smallest first, next smallest second, next smallest third, and so on. And then we rearrange um, the data in HW according to this ordering vector. So now the <clears throat> everything goes nicely in, in terms of all the values go from left to right, not all over the place. And since they all go from left to right, we can consistently draw a curve from them. So we, recomp we compute the uh, PP and PC in that sorted order, i.e. based on the resorted values here <laughs> with intervals of confidence and prediction. And then we plot it. You can use a standard um, scatter plot. I've used one of the density plots here um, just to integrate something we've done previously uh, using these density colors, um, which, gives, which shows me that um, most values in that data set are very small, and only a small number of values then become larger and larger. And um, I specify the label of the x-axis, mf.control, the label of the y-axis, mf.lps. The y limits uh, to lie in the range that my prediction gives me. If, that, if I wouldn't be doing that, then the y-axis limits would be bounded here by the, by the highest value of the actual point. But my, my, the limits that I want to plot can go beyond the highest point. So if I want to include them on my plot and, and not have them truncated um, or have them truncated at the bottom here, I need to redefine the y-axis limits uh, with some expression like that. So the range between um, the maximum range of the highest and lowest in my prediction intervals. Plotting character is simply a filled circle. Uh, character expansion is one, i.e. keep the circles relatively small, and that gives me this plot. And then I had to change nothing with these lines. It's exactly the same command um, for the prediction boundaries and the model boundaries. And, and you see that in the correlation between <coughs> induced and, and non-induced data, um, the the linear correlation is very highly defined, but there's also a lot of noise, and there's quite a number of, of, um, of points that fall significantly away from that line. And these would potentially be points of interest to look for actual regulation in response to the stimulus. So one final question here is maybe why, why do we see such structure here? What does that structure mean? Where does that come from? Why does it look gridded? Any idea? So whenever you see structure in data, you'll know you'll have to explain it. If not to yourself, then to your supervisor. Worst of all, if your supervisor is yourself. Um, well, basically, what, what these gaps in the data mean is there's values here, but nothing in between. How can that be? Well, because of the limited numerical uh, precision we had in our data. So many, many of these data points, um, simply depending on the numerical uh, precision, we are not using the entire range of the x-axis here. That's all that means, nor of the, of the y-axis.